Great. So we're live. Um, please help yourself to some food throughout the hour, um, the first hour. And um, if you need to get up and use the restroom at any time, please do. Um, you're free to move. You're all adults. You don't have to ask to get a drink or go to the bathroom in my class. Um, and I think those are all the housekeeping things. Please eat the food if I don't have to take it home um, with me. Um, before we get started, um, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time that we can get together and um, share a meal with other leaders in Kids Club at Oakley. And I'm just so thankful that these individuals have responded to the call to be a leader in Kids Club. Um, bless them, bless this food, bless this night, um, and help us all learn one new thing, at least. In your name I pray, amen. Cool. So some people are joining us by stream. Some people are watching this video later. So we'll say hi to them if we want to um, in time, but welcome. So this is how this works. Great. A little bit of an overview of our time together. We're going to spend the first hour just kind of getting on the same page with a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to go over some guidelines for K-5 to volunteers in general, some for room leaders and volunteers that are in leadership roles, um, some emergency procedures, which are always delightful and I feel very necessary, um, a little bit of a weekend experience like classroom management, and then we'll wrap up the first hour with shepherding and how we're caring for our people a little bit more. Um, and then the second hour is going to be maybe what you're all really excited to hear about or one of the reasons why I forced you to come. Um, we're having a new vision for Kids Club, so we're going to talk about that at the second hour, and there will be a break in between. So back to some basics. I am going to have Abby, if you could. Hi, come on in. Abby, if you could pass out those packets to everybody. <laughs> I'm going to give you a job. Yeah, and if you're watching this and you don't have a packet, we'll get you one. Um, so just to refocus ourselves, the mission of Kids Club is to create fun, welcoming, and safe environments for kids, families, and volunteers to experience God and grow in their faith. And today we're kind of focusing a little bit on that volunteer aspect, volunteers being you as leaders and the volunteers that you're leading in Kids Club and what it's going to look like moving forward. The leadership in Kids Club looks a little bit like this. We have a staff contact. Right now that's me, K5. We have service leaders in most hours, not all of them yet, that oversee um, room leaders who oversee volunteers. And we also have presenter leaders. We have three presenter leaders. Mariana is one of them. She leads the kindergarten presenters. Um, we have Victor who leads first and second grade presenters. And Jeanette, who is streaming this right now, um, who leads our third to fifth grade presenters. So why have leadership in Kids Club? Um, if you, someone wouldn't mind turning to 1 Corinthians 12 for me. Um, it's kind of, kind of a long chapter, but I thought we could spend some time reading it out loud um, just to focus ourselves of why we have leadership and why there's a difference or a hierarchy um, in Kids Club. So if someone has it, if they wouldn't mind starting to read the first chunk and then we have a volunteer to read the second chunk. I'll just assign you. Is it a race? <laughs> like, it is a race. It's like a Bible race. I can read it if I can do it. <laughs> Great. Claire will read one of them. Who has it? Andrew, will you read the first part? Sure. Thanks. Uh, nice and loud. First Corinthians 12, concerning <laughs> spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another the message of not a message of knowledge by 
means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing that by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. <laughs> All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Now it's gonna get awkward. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one, the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to your body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. <clears throat> if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet I show, and yet I show you the most excellent way. Thanks, Claire and Andrew. So... What that kind of says to me is that we all have been given different gifts. And at one point or another, someone has called you or asked you into leadership in Kids Club. And as a leader, you have different <coughs> gifts that you bring to the table. But all of us that make up Kids Club, whether it's the prep team, adventure club people, people that wear the headsets and run around like crazy chickens, um, which is me sometimes, um, all the way down to our volunteers and all the way up to you guys. We all are part of this body. And so when we're working together and we're functioning as a team, um, just wonderful things happen. And we've seen that and we've seen the good side and the bad side of that. So I just want to read that together to be encouraged that leadership and different skills are valued in the Bible. And so um, we should value them here too. So guidelines. In your packet, we have two sets of guidelines. The first are kindergarten to fifth grade guidelines. The audience for these guidelines are new volunteers or people that are still in that like volunteer role. They know their group. They're maybe not in leadership yet. So kind of when you're looking over those, take it with that kind of eye. A lot of the time it's asking them to seek out their room leader if they have questions or if they run into a problem. Um, so it's just something good for you to be familiar with. All new volunteers receive a copy of this once they completely onboard. So that means once they are fully cleared volunteers, we've gotten all their background checks in, they picked a team, I've interviewed them, um, because I interview everyone that comes onto the teams now, um, they get these guidelines. And so this is kind of what your new observer has as a reference, besides all the other times they've observed maybe in your room or in another room. So this is about the basis of their knowledge. Um, you can go through that and see like what kind of questions might you still have as a volunteer. You probably have a lot um, because as we all know, it just is better to practice before you kind of fully understand what Kids Club's all about. The next one is our room leader guidelines. They're kind of long. Um, not everyone in here is a room leader. Some people are service leaders, but you get the general gist of what leaders are doing in Kids Club. Um, Let's just spitball what you think some weekday responsibilities are for a room leader. That's what most of you are in here. Weekday? Yeah. Um, like texting a group or everything together. 
making sure everyone has the lesson and knows what they're coming down with you. Yeah, so texting your group, getting your group together, making sure they have the lesson. It's a great responsibility. That covers a lot. Um, that's that's, that's, that's say, a that's lot. Kind of it. Yeah. How do you know who's signed up and who's not signed up? Just the email? Mm -hmm. What? The that's master schedule? Like the master schedule. Yep. <clears throat> and now on Sign Up to Serve, you can actually go in and message your team from like the website too. If that's helpful, and you can kind of click on people that aren't signed up and be like specifically, hello. <laughs> um, also, I found out this past weekend that anyone who is labeled a leader, which is all of you, if someone emails leadership um, through Sign Up to Serve, so through the Crossroads website, they actually are going to send an email to me and another one to you. And I think that you might be receiving cancellation emails too. If you are and it is becoming an annoyance to you, please let me know and I will talk to IT about it. I didn't know that that was going to be part of their change. Um, so I'm like, you guys are going to be getting a lot of emails, and that's really annoying. So I'm sorry about that. Weekend responsibilities? What do you guys think? Be here on time. Be here on time. Yeah. What's on time, Mary? 25 minutes before the service. Yes, 25 <laughs> minutes before the service. Yes. Delegate, too. Like, separate out tasks in the room and pray with your team, too. Delegate out tasks, pray with your team. That's good stuff. And you can't pray with your team if you're walking in like five minutes before <laughs> service starts. Yeah. And your team doesn't feel like they have a job. But, yep. Um, handling emergencies is a big one. If something really major happens in your room, you're kind of the point person um, to handle that emergency. Um, you might be the person who leaves the room and gets a staff person. Um, anything else that comes to mind? You guys can read too, so I'm going to let you read that on your own time. And if you have questions about either of those guidelines, let's talk. Um, the next thing in your packet is I promise. Um, as leaders, you should have at one point in time signed the I promise document and sent a copy to the staff contact. If you haven't done that, please read over it. You can initial it, take a picture of it, email it to me. Um, as leaders in Crossroads, we ask all leaders to submit to the I Promise document. It's what all staff signs. Um, there's a list of all the goodies that you're agreeing to as a leader. And it's really because you're a mouthpiece of the church now. You are not only shepherding people underneath you, but you are a mouthpiece for Crossroads. And these are the things we believe in and what we're going after. Um, and kind of how I look at the I Promise document is if you're running after God and you make a mistake, if you come and confess to your one up, the person above you or to someone else, or I find out about it, you know, cause you confessed it to me, like that's okay. Um, we're talking like major things too. If you are blatantly turning your back on God and walking in the other direction against the I promise document, then we need to have a serious conversation about you stepping down from leadership. So it's kind of an important document. Also, if you sneak around it, and then we find out later that you're violating something in the I Promise document. That's even worse than if you didn't come and um, confess it the first time. So just be honest. Let's all hold each other accountable. I appreciate this document because I know that um, Abby back there, who's the K5 director in Mason, she's not bad-mouthing me to someone else. She has a problem. She comes right to me about it. Um, I know that Andrew is practicing spiritual disciplines, and he knows that I am too, and we can hold each other accountable. So that's... It's really just the health of a church that we're doing with I Promise. All right, so with that, we are gonna have a little bit of time to talk about emergency procedures. I'm going to introduce Andrew Hartman. He is the 1005 kindergarten room leader. He loves safety. He talks about it way better than I do, and he's way more fun. So, welcome, Andrew. Hello. Can you just click those buttons? Both, the obvious forward time, right? Yeah. Uh, well, hi. Uh, my name is Andrew Hartman. I've been volunteering, and hello, all of you guys. Uh, I've been volunteering here about four years, and was anybody here about a year ago now? Uh, at the last spring training, I did an emergency, like emergency procedure talk, safety talk back then. Um, so back then, I gave a conversation about just safety in general around kid, Kids Club. We found there were a lot of things that we wanted to make sure everybody knew about uh, that were going on. Who here? 
because uh, this is a room full of leaders. Who here was uh, here a couple months ago when we had an emergency evacuation? Anyone? How, how many of you guys felt like that entire experience went exactly the plan, like could not have gone better? Phenomenal. <laughs> Excellent, excellent, and that's- Carla was at 11.45, so they had practice. <laughs> nice, nice, and that's what we hope for there. Um, well, no, I'm sorry, we don't hope for practice, but it's good that you had it. Uh, but honestly, I was a leader at the time for the 10.05 when it was like suddenly, surprise, we're getting out of the building. Uh, and for me, I had just a couple months earlier given an entire conversation about safety procedures, uh, properly evacuating the building and finding your zone, so I knew exactly where my zone was. Uh, and when I found myself uh, outside of the building, <laughs> I was on the completely wrong end of the building. Um, I was in the front of the building. I had done all this practice in my mind, knowing where my zone was, and went completely the wrong direction. In the kindergarten room, there are two exits, um, and I chose the wrong one of the two. I had a 50-50 shot and messed it up. And that's because I had studied my zone super well, but I didn't know my path that I was gonna be taking. Now, that was a moment where I honestly could have had a bit of panic in the moment, uh, but as leaders, our entire thing is to be as calm as possible. So while it is important to know your zone, it is equally important to know your path to get to that zone, so make sure as leaders you're prepared with that. Uh, but this conversation being a room full of leaders, I'm not gonna question your ability to know what to do in the case of an evacuation. Realistically, this is a conversation more about how to lead your team through those emergencies as well. Uh, and when you have a team, you need to be able to communicate to them in the moment. We know, as we've mentioned before, that our role is to assign tasks within the room, right? We get excited about this for the week, but when it comes to the emergency, that is equally important. And I'm sure you experienced that as well in those emergencies when we were, our, I'm sorry, in the moment we were evacuating the building, assigning out those tasks. It has to be done in a calm manner. Uh, so just sort of the key things within that that I kind of took away from it is that you have to be confident in the moment and confident in the leadership that's been entrusted to us. Uh, you have to control the chaos and give yourself a lot of mental practice on how you're going to get the team out of the room. And realistically, when we do that, we have to do it in such a way that we're speaking in a way that speaks to the positive, right? You don't want to get up in front of everybody and say, guys, we need to get out of the room right now, because that would just incite more panic. It needs to be spun to a little bit more positive. For us, when we were getting out, my entire phrase with the kindergartners was just like, guys, we get to go outside today, and we're gonna to get to show this entire church how cool of a team kindergarten is. Uh, and in that, I started delegating tasks. Hey, Miss Erin is gonna be at the back of the line and she is just gonna be keeping an eye on all of you guys and just watching for our good leaders within the line. Can you guys show Miss Erin how good of a leader you are here? Uh, and in doing that, it was just a subtle way and a calm way to start assigning tasks that didn't make it seem like there was a bigger emergency going on, albeit we had no idea what was going on in the moment. Uh, so assign duties, be confident, and choose those positive words for your teams. Those will go a long way in just helping them getting through that moment. Now, can I ask what, yeah. what happened in the room? Do you hear an alarm go off? Yeah, you. it was a very classic quintessential, the question for the people at home in case you couldn't hear it was, uh, what happens in the room when the alarm does go off? It's the very classic like, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo, and the blinky lights going off and the kids are just like, like the, a kid in our room literally said, is that an alarm? And we said, Yes, it is. Let's line up, everybody. And fortunately for the upper rooms, kids experience alarms at school all the time. They know the concept of a drill. So we can sort of speak to that like, all right, guys, let's have fun. Let's get a conga line going here. We're going to get out the room. And in my mind, the entire time, the only thing I was thinking was, ah! but realistically, the communication was very different. Uh, so that's a little bit on just getting the people out of the room to talk a little bit on what goes on inside of the room. We have incidents in the room, right? Uh, when things don't really go as expected. Internal incidents are just those sort of times where we need to get the message to the parents. To tell a quick story of something that happened in my room, I think it was around Easter Sunday or what one of those Sundays, uh, we had a kid who tripped in kindergarten. And initially, that's no big deal. If I wrote an incident report every time a kid tripped in kindergarten, staff would never stop calling parents. and that's pretty real, they trip all the time, they're very top heavy, they go down. Uh, but this particular kid, when he went down, he gets up and just says, ow. And the second he does, opens his mouth, blood just starts pouring out of his mouth. Well, now we're dealing with an incident report at this point. Uh, so anytime you need to get the message to the parents, we as leaders have the, an awesome staff leadership team here. 
when you're filling out an incident report, and some of you may never have had to, I hope you never really have to, but if you're doing it, be familiar with that form. Help your team know that they need to help you coordinate that situation as well, uh, as far as tasks go, because the incident report does take a little bit of time just to get used to filling out. At this point, I've filled out a few of them, so um, they get more comfortable over time. So with those incidents, uh, if they do occur, don't think of this as the moment I need to tattle on the kid or maybe the kid's just acting up a little bit. Those are reserved for those moments where something significant occurred and we need to just sort of get that information out to the parents and we have our trusted staff to do so. Uh, when it comes to your teams, your teams should be fully informed about uh, how to do, evacuate in the case of an emergency, how to fill out these uh, or at least coordinate for these incident reports. And the conversation entirely begins with onboarding. So when you're welcoming your new teammates, anybody in here get a recent teammate within like the last six months or so? I did as well uh, pretty recently. Did you guys yet have the emergency procedure conversation with that onboarded person? <laughs> I haven't either. I haven't either. Uh, and it's easy for these to fall under the radar. This should be an ongoing conversation. Onboarding is the perfect time to introduce that conversation. But the ongoing conversation is with your team regularly. The thing I recognized most in the uh, evacuation of the building was that my team didn't exactly know what to do, so it was very easy to step into that leadership role. But I also realized that they need to know what to do if there's ever a weekend I'm not there. Uh, so this is an ongoing conversation. For me, I'm actually use, I use my calendar on this a lot. I'm intending to set up just like once every third month, once every fourth month or so, twice a year or so, remind myself in my calendar to just refresh my team on the different various uh, situations that could arise. Not all at once. It doesn't need to be a 30-minute conversation. It's as easy as saying a prayer empowering your team. Uh, so in my room, that could be shaped as something like, Father God, thank you so much for the leaders that are in this room. Uh, and I just pray that you are with them if there is ever anything that you would empower them in the moment and help maintain calm nerves as that occurs. We don't want any incidents, and I pray against those things, but if something comes up, I just pray we have the, uh, the awareness to react appropriately. But yeah, that's a little bit about emergencies and procedures within Kids Club. Up next is... I have a question. Yes. Where do you find incident reports and where do you put them after you fill them out? Oh, that is a really good question. Uh, so for instance, report, incident reports, if you're not familiar with it, everybody in here knows where their emergency packet is, correct, I'm assuming. If you're not familiar with where your emergency packet is, you should definitely find that. Within there, you're going to find literally your how-to guide for everything in an emergency, whether it's a tornado evacuation, whether it's a fire drill, whether it's um, an incident report. Things like that are all located within there. Those are the things you want to grab on your way out of the building as well. When you fill that out, chances are you um, will most, depending on the incident, kid busted his lip open. We did call down the staff at the moment like, what do what should we do in this? Uh, but when you finish fill those out, you should be tearing off the bottom. One piece um, goes to the parent and the other one goes to our staff here. The one that goes to the parent is just so they have a reference that something was taken down that we did uh, get some notation. And in your packets, actually, you're going to find the emergency procedures for Crossroads. That Those procedures are designed for the staff members more so. So you're going to see words and phrases in there that you probably never saw before. Heck, I gave an entire conversation on this uh, about a year ago. There were words in there that was like, who is, who is the emergency coordinator for Kids Club? And they're like, you don't need, honestly need to know. It's radio programs that go on in case of more ele escalated things. But from you guys, because Kristen makes a good point, are there any questions from you guys based around this? I was curious about the um, places or zones, like how they're impacted by all the construction. Yeah. Going on, like, um, are they still basically in the same place or just in the parking lot? Yeah, for those, I believe those are still in the same place. Thank and you. for the people at home, the question was with the zones, are those in the same place? The zones with all the construction that's occurring, will those be in the same place? And the answer is absolutely yes. They're still in the same zone in the same area. And that's where we would get to. And if they move, we'll let you know. <laughs> and if we need a refresher on our zones and evacuation procedures, it's in the, it's in our room in the, Manual. The packet in your room hanging by the door, typically by the phone as well, those will hold all of the locations for your particular room. Uh, obviously, in the moment, you won't need to worry about any of the other rooms because they need to worry about themselves, but you can sort of be that voice as well. Like, hey, you don't know where you're going? Well, follow me. And typically with the zones, I believe they're labeled kind of based on room currently. Yeah. They start with age, 
So like one, two. So don't think that's first and second mm -hmm. grade. That's a one year old and a two year old. And then they go up through grades. I thought yeah. they relabeled them actually to add the little. <laughs> yes. Yes. First, you know. Oh, the one saint? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. One <laughs> saint is now there. <laughs> one yes. saint, two saint, three saint. Yeah. Is that the only alarm that you'll find? Like, if you hear that alarm that you're describing, that automatically means evacuation. Everything else will be over the loudspeaker, like a tornado or some other kind of form of emergency will just announce what yeah. is. Yes. Even this code atom will be announced. This, um, this mm -hmm. That usually is done over um, headsets. Over headsets so yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure if anyone's been in here when we've lost a kid before. Super Bowl weekend, there was a kid lost, but they actually weren't lost. And they were going around each family. Yeah, I remember them coming around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Typically on big events, we lose a child or a parent. <laughs> <laughs> but they get reunited very quickly So because there's a procedure. But yeah, they're on a headset um, that codes other people so to hear that alarm that automatically will be evacuated. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that happened that weekend a couple of months ago that caused a lot of distress was whether or not you're allowed to check the kids out once you've accounted for them all. Because of course the alarms went off, parents converged uh, onto our little signs and groups looking right. for their kids and they wanted to take them. So do you want to address that? I don't I don't I so, feel like there were instructions in the packet and it didn't work out that way. So yeah. I just wasn't sure if were the packets updated or were we doing it right and we should have done it. Well, I let one go before we got into trouble and we thought I was supposed to. <laughs> Did you let them go like before said, you got the roster no, and checked, had checked it? everybody off and they wanted to go and then they said no, they couldn't have them and they made us take them all the way back up to the room and the parents had to come with us and then check them out from there, which upset the parents tremendously and some refused to cooperate and just took their children and so it was kind of a scene so i just was kind of curious is the rule once they're checked off the roster you can let them go do you have something to say for that day i think what happened what was documented the procedure is a little vague it says once you make sure you have everybody you can release them uh it wasn't the smoothest situation because we had a couple thousand people trying to get their kids. We had police officers saying, no, you can't go here. No, you can't go there. And there were seven people with headsets that were landlocked with a few of us running back and forth. And I don't know exactly who, but somebody with a headset made the call that, no, don't let anybody go right now, take them back up to the room. So that's not mm -hmm. what was documented, but that's what was decided in the moment. And that was decided in the moment because there was active shooter threats at the mm -hmm. same time. So we had to take an extra precaution not to let children leave because the police mm -hmm. thought that they saw someone with duffel bags and stuff. So like, I would say whatever, like, yes, typically if you don't hear anything else from staff, you should, once you get the roster and you check your kids, you can check the kid against the roster and check the kid out to the parent. Unless someone else comes across and says, no, you cannot do that. You Police officers a paper unfortunately. roster then. Yes, you get a paper roster. Yeah, you can't let anybody go. So you guys have a roster. Yeah. 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 That's how it stands right now. If it gets updated, we will update you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Have you ever kind of drilled that, like, where the kids would be safe from that kind of active shooter situation. Like, you know, like in schools, they go locked down the grill. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the building's not safe right now. Is there any safe place in the classroom in there? The, Are our doors locked? Even? Our doors don't lock. We don't have extreme measures to protect against an active threat right now. There is a procedure, um, but it could use some improvement. Some of the rooms in Kids Club are more secure than others, for example, like nursery. That we can't shut down those rooms. There's no glass on those windows. So you guys have more options upstairs where you could put kids. But quite frankly, kids know a lot better than we do of how to hide themselves. So they practice in school all the time. So I'd be more concerned about all of you. <laughs> I, I have one question too. Sure. Have we ever done a drill for emergency? Yeah. No. Okay. 
just that, because of what happened. Well, it was there. a couple months ago. Yeah, <laughs> you could count that as drill, yeah. <laughs> right? Perhaps we could do that at conscious drill with our volunteers. <laughs> and honestly, people did great. I mean, I thought really like our hour. I thought they really did great. Everybody stayed super calm, and you know, it, it actually we did fine. It wasn't until we got out there and the parents got in the mix that yeah. it got. A little bit nuts. Mm -hmm. well, Chuck, yeah. Chuck said from main stage one time that, that you should say follow me and assertive things that people mm -hmm. will follow you if you say follow me, but if they hear you saying don't go there, don't go there, they, people won't listen to you. That's really a good yeah, it is. I thought that was really wise of him to say that and to know that the children know what they're doing. Yeah, because they do it in school all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, kindergartners have done it as direction. much though yeah. as right. older kids. Yeah. 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 So we'll have a little bit of a break and we can hang around afterward to ask some more questions if we have them, but we need to move on. Um, our next person is going to talk about weekend experience and that's John Wilson. He's obviously not in the room. So he was here on Sunday. I recorded him. We are going to watch his talk from Sunday, which gives you guys some visual stimulants, you know, um, like video stuff. Um, so we're going to watch him and yeah, here we go. All right. So, with that being said, I video people, and I'll be saying some things to them a couple times throughout this as well. Um, part of the reason I, or the entire reason I won't be here on Wednesday is because I'm going to be with sixth graders at camp, um, which means I'm going to have to apply everything I say right now about management um, in like the most intense situations. I get to sleep in rooms with 11 year olds. So all these things about patience and giving kids benefit of the doubt and things like that, I'm going to have to be actively uh, applying by the time you all are watching this. So, uh, really quick note, a lot of us are only experienced with kids uh, outside of these, these walls here. Maybe was as a student in school. And one of the things I hear a lot is kind of pulling from our experience as students I and mean, how to work with kids. And so one of the things that I am making really clear these days is kids club is not school. And so the reason that I say that, because I really feel like I, I'm allowed to say that is, is because having worked in a school and working in a school now, um, good, bad, or otherwise, kids don't like school, I feel like, more now than they ever have before. Um, and to me, that's an issue that I, I engage with regularly and I think about a lot as part of my professional world because I don't like the kids feel that way. Um, our district just took a recent survey and it showed that of elementary students, 50%, said they would rather be somewhere else. And it got only higher as kids got older, but our kids, one and two, don't want to be there. That's a problem, and when, uh, I think this is really the monster of that. If you Google school, this is from this morning, I just updated this morning from the previous presentation. School makes me want to commit, sad, school makes me sad, want to cry, feel stupid, sad, want to die. Um, these are just, this is Google's predicted search. And so one of the things is, if this is what we're trying to model kids go after, if your biggest reference is, oh, this is not the way we do things in school, well, look, school's not doing so great. And that's my other that's my other world, and that's something I professionally am taking on, trying to change, but that's not our thing here. So if, you're, if your frame of reference is we wouldn't allow this in school, well, obviously school's not working, so maybe that shouldn't be our frame of reference. Um, so when you Google kids club makes me, believe it or not, no predictive text at this point. With Crossroads getting bigger and bigger, my thought is, let's define that, though. Let's think about what do we want that to be? What do we want Google to auto-predict? Um, if in the future, like as kids club gets larger, as Crossroads gets larger, who's to say that that couldn't have an auto-predict? What We get to fill in those blanks. We get to change what it's predicting. Obviously, I want to change what's on the left there, uh, but what's on the right is what we actually have control over right now. Let's make that a positive narrative. Like, kids club makes me want to go, or kids club makes me excited or feel empowered or feel loved, all those things. That's what we want it to predict when, hopefully, down the road, it does have an auto-predict feature there. Okay, so we're gonna talk through just a couple different ways that we can do that. Um, I know management, depending on the hour, depending on sites, depending on where we are, is, is an issue. And we've got, we have kids that we deal with, and I hear this a lot, like, okay, you're saying all these positive things, how though, how in the moment of a kid running around screaming, what do I do about that? So let's talk about just basic management. You're going to see my numbers up there. Um, for people that are watching, um, I'm going to actually be actively on my phone as much as possible, even while I'm gone. So you can you can send me a text. Uh, you guys can too. They're in the room right now, but you can also just ask me with a normal person. Um, but if you are watching this on a video, you're welcome to text me questions uh, that you might have in regard management. Oh, so I usually say a presenter should take care of about 80% 
of management in a room. Um, if you have a room that's just going crazy, uh, I know you guys are room leaders, you're empowering your presenter, or whatever we're calling that role in the future. Whoever is like actively leading the room um, should be able to manage about 80% of the kids. Um, that's, that's, that's a pretty healthy perspective. Where our kids who are generally engaged, you're able to manage them. We'll talk about how to do that in a second. Your other volunteers are there for the 20%. The kids who are running around yelling, like whoever is leading that room, it might be you if you're not the presenter. You might be the one trying to engage with those kids on the outside. Um, but try and make it so the presenter is just taking care of that majority. Um, and if your presenters aren't feeling like they're able to do that, then we've kind of got a little bit of an issue. We want them to be able to control the majority of the kids. Okay? Um, so let's talk through this. Three big ideas today. These are the three things that I've, as I've done this and multiple times that I've led a lot of different rooms, these are the three things that to me it comes down to to create a successful experience with kids. The first one is clear, positive expectations. In our script right now, I think it's still written uh, between connect time and between large group to have kind of a, go over a couple of things um, to go over with kids. I tend to say, get out in front of it right away. So you'll see in any room I ever do, especially in kindergarten to third grade, um, we set clear positive expectations. And that usually looks like me going through the same kind of spiel week to week. And the kids that I'm with uh, in second grade like know that by heart. Um, and even my volunteers now are starting to do the, that same spiel and can do it really well. And so it just talks about we go over the word respect. And in a second, you're going to be able to create your own because this is about you internalizing what works in your room. We go over the same word respect every week. We might give examples. We might not, but we talk about what that word means. And I always let kids know that, yes, as an as the adults in the room, we do expect respect, but we also respect you and we expect you to respect each other. It's, it's a kind of all-around experience there. And that's one of ours. And then we always go over those. You guys, if you know me, if you've ever been in a training with me, we always have a kuna Vitata or to infinity beyond, some kind of call and response. And that's invaluable. Today, we forgot to go over that in the first part. Um, and we did connect time, and it was just like, ah, everything went kind of went crazy. And so between connect time and large group, we retooled to make sure that we, we brought that in. Just some way to get kids back in. Um, and even in older groups, I make sure to have some kind of response way, because otherwise, I, I don't know how to get to, like, without going, hey, 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 okay, come on. You know, like, that's just, that, that's, we've all been there, I'm sure. That's just kind of a crazy thing. So we'll get to talk about that. I'm going to let you guys have a chance to uh, kind of internalize this in just like, three minutes. So, proactive, not reactive. This is something I've kind of added in that you, even if you've heard me before, uh, you probably haven't heard me say this. It's something I'm trying to be really good about in my classroom as well. And they even talked about it at Surface this weekend, um, kind of in a different way. So, if you know a kid's probably going to have a rough week, if you know that they have a hard time with expectations, if you know, like, instead of when their name pops up on the screen, your response being something like, oh, because we've been there. We all probably know that kid that when they pop up on the left, you're like, okay, okay, it's going to be that kind of week. Um, if you think about, if you know that about them, then start being proactive with that kid. So we we know that we have buddies in our room. Some of our volunteers are just really great. Like, we know they take care of this one kid who just connects really well with them. You know that they probably, they're going to have a hard time with the things that you're doing. So why, instead of just getting frustrated and being reactive, so if you know that's happening, be proactive. Think about what does this kid seem to thrive under. Try and find something that works for that for that child, because otherwise you're just going to keep getting frustrated, and that just kind of repeats the cycle. And it doesn't help, me, right? You know, it doesn't help us get worked up. It doesn't help them if we're getting worked up. So let's figure out what works and then use that. Being proactive there. Okay. The final one, transition. That's the part that I think is going to be really important with the new structure that you guys are going to be hearing about in a little bit. Transitions are happening more. We have to be able to get kids from one to another. Doing those Hakuna Matata as the call and response, those kind of things are going to be a big part of that. Also setting really clear expectations for what transition looks like. It can be positive. Um, Mike, who meets with me at 1145, does a great job of telling kids, hey, walk like a penguin, walk like an Egyptian, walk like something. Um, and it, it gives them a, a task that they're doing. He also sets expectations, and I do as well, to say, this is what we're doing. When I say, whatever that keyword is, do this. When I say, do this. And that says, like, hey, I'm not done yet. I'm, gonna, I'm still going over some things. Uh, but when I say do this, the other big thing with all of these is they shouldn't take up that much time. Expectations at the beginning, if they're doing, if you're taking more than two minutes to do that, you've lost them and you're doing it wrong. You should do it, but it shouldn't be like, now let me go over the 67 rules for making sure that we don't have any incidents and kids block. Make sure you sit exactly like this. If it's like this, it's wrong. If you're on your back, it's wrong. If you're doing this, not that. It should be simple, it should be easy to remember, and kids should be able to repeat it no matter where you are. Okay? 
Another thing that this is just aside from this morning, uh, if you were in service at uh, Oakley, Robbie had us take a picture of the screen that was talking about kind of the, the verse, the basics for, um, uh, what's it called? Reckless Love. And so um, I just kind of thought, this is my lock screen. Now I went ahead and made it my techie way of doing things. Um, this song has powerful implications for when we're teaching kids, I think. Uh, if Jesus is willing to go after us, if God's willing to reach out to us no matter what, I think we should remember that. And this is this is more from my school side, but it's equally applicable here. Like that song, we are here for that one. Like that's my mission, at least. That's maybe that's not your my why is very much for the one, not for the the 99 I love, and it's so great. And if they were all the one, and in some ways they are at points, but if they were all the one during the hour, I would probably lose my mind too. But keep in mind, like, the entire reason, the powerful kid that we're going to be able to, to, to really be able to impact is the one, the one who's who's out and is, is far away, and the one who literally might be running around the room, he might be the lost one. You know, maybe figuratively, usually literally, they're running around. And that's why we're here. So I, I challenge her to look up that verse, internalize that verse, really do make your luxury in that picture or or find it in Luke, um, and make that something that, that you internalize and you see. When you remember, like, this kid is driving me crazy right now, like, remember that's our mission here. Like, that's my why, at least. I challenge you to know your why. Um, it's for that that one that's that's a little bit different. Okay? So what I'm going to give you guys to, that's all I have to say about management. Usually I give you, like, 6,000 things that are really high energy way, and then everyone's like, what? What do I do? What do I do? That's it. This, this never happens with me. Um, so it's three things, and so what I'm going to do, I kind of set this up, you can set up like a chart, I like charts. Um, in those notes sections, what I'm going to do, give you like, maybe three or four minutes. I know what you about each of those the three things. What would that look like in your room? How could you set a positive expectation? It doesn't have to be my thing. You don't have to have it exactly like me. That's what works for me. But you should have some kind of way of setting up expectations. Um, expectations is a word I don't love, but I haven't thought of one that says the same thing without sounding like there's a school. Like, I, I don't know how to say that. Just telling kids what you expect of them because kids will not rise to expectations you never set. That's a big thing for me. Like, we get mad at kids for not doing something. Maybe they really don't know, or maybe they just need to be reminded. So don't get mad until you hold them, and don't get mad at all. But don't, don't get frustrated with something you've never told them about. Um, make sure you're being proactive. How can you be proactive? You know that kid. I don't have to tell you right now. You know the kid that's coming to mind. What has worked with them in the past? And if you haven't figured that out, um, then that needs to be your mission next. Just figuring out what works for that for that kid that you can keep it positive without uh, without kind of getting that spot where we're all getting frustrated. And then how can you make transitions strong, seamless? So that might be the when I say this, do this, it might be color, giving colored stickers to kids, which I'm sure that we can, can get arranged if we need to, making sure that you have a way to tell kids where to go. Um, and setting like clear expectations for this is what we're going to do. We're going from here to here, and I need you to do that in this way. Um, it's positive, but we don't want the thing where when I first started, like, I would say, hey, we're going to small group. And I remember literally being in that second grade room and having kids running on the slides and losing total control of the room. I didn't, I didn't tell them how to transition. I was just like, go over there. And they're like, there's a slide over there. I'm going to go do that thing. That sounds fun. You know, because they're like seven. Like that's normal. So, kind of sets them up like this. You can go on your phone, you can your packet, under where you do it. Somehow, think through, I want you to think through what, at least one point you can make each of these areas so you can apply next weekend um, that's going to make you like more successful in your room. Like, what can you do, or what are you already doing that makes these things work? So, that's all I have. Um, I said three things. You can't. Uh, wow. Like the least I've ever done. So, thank you guys. Great. So we have John's slides here, so you can all kind of take a better look at them because I know the video is a little bit grainy. Um, here we go. Kids Club's not school. Kids Club makes me. This is his number two if you want to write it down. John's really cool. He'll meet with you. Um, if you're ever interested in watching him present or lead a room, he's 1145 second grade or um, 615 third and fourth grade. So he kind of runs the gambit. Here's three big ideas. Set clear, positive expectations. Be proactive, not reactive. Plan for transitions. Plan for transitions. Plan for transitions. Plan for transitions. Kids need to know, we're leaving the playground in five minutes, not get in the car, we're going home, right? Why would we do the same in Kids Club? This is his little lock screen. Kind of cute, right? 
And I'm going to send out these slides to, to all of you and a link to the video in case you want to go back and reference it. So take about two minutes and kind of make this little chart in your notes section. <coughs> if you need a pen, let me know. Um, and make this chart and kind of kind of do what John instructed. Like, how does this look in my room? Um, it's a pen. <laughs> transition in one more minute we'll start something else very well played <laughs> yeah <laughs> i feel ready for that now great <laughs> something else very random Great. So, food for thought, interesting stuff, and we're all preparing you for what's going to come in the next hour. So, on that note, I will continue to prepare you for what you will learn in the next hour. I'm going to talk about building a team. We did do a KC201 about building a team. I know Carla was there. I don't know if any of the rest of you streamed it or not. Um, so the entire building a team presentation and making volunteers feel welcomed and appreciated, um, you can watch at another time if you want to. Some of these concepts are going to be repeated a little bit. Some are new. So um, Kids Club Leadership, what's the big deal, right? You guys are all here. I hauled you here. Why do we have leaders? Um, you turn to Exodus 18, 13 to 23. It's a part in the Bible where the um, Israelites have escaped from Egypt. They're kind of wandering around the desert. Moses is hearing from the Lord. They're getting structure. Um, and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, has found Moses. I don't know how, but he does. He like finds him in the middle of the desert and brings like all of his kids and Moses' like, wives and whatever. And they all find Moses and... Um, Moses is super excited, like, look, I did the thing. I, like, broke out of Egypt. It's awesome. Um, and watch this. Tomorrow, like, it's going to be super sweet. And Chuck talked about this a little bit in church a couple weeks ago. Um, so Jethro was like, all right, I'll, I'll come see whatever this really cool thing is. And um, he comes. And the next day, Moses literally holds court with hundreds of people and listens to all of their problems. And Jethro turns to Moses and, like, this is stupid. You're dumb. Like, you need to delegate, you need to push leadership down, you need to have your people that you build into, who build into other people, who then build into more people. So everyone is getting personal attention, being discipled, being built into. You can't possibly do that with hundreds of people. Um, likewise, I can't possibly do that with hundreds of people that are on the K-5 to team. Um, so Chuck, this has come up a couple times in our team over the last couple months, but Chuck has personally challenged me like, it's just not healthy. Like, one, you're having a baby, obviously, if you didn't know. Um, and you're, like, not going to be around for a couple weeks. Like, you can't continue to do this while you're gone. Two, 35 people that are, like, leaders that are directly reporting to you, that's a lot of people. Um, you could put people at each service that could oversee those people, and that way you're working with maybe six to eight people on a very consistent basis and room leaders every so often. Um, as needed. And that's not to say I'm not going to connect with room leaders or 
the average volunteer um, on a regular basis. I still do that, um, but actually pouring into excessive amounts of time and trainings and stuff that um, is what Chuck is kind of challenging me on coming out of this Jethro um, scripture. I also wanted to talk as leaders a little bit about attrition. We did an attrition study at Crossroads um, and we just learned about the results and essentially the team that put this information together they looked at a specific demographic of people. They had been super in. They had been involved in Crossroads. They've been coming here for years. They had been tithers, um, and they left. And so Crossroads wanted to know why. Um, and one of the reasons was they went through a crisis in their life, and nobody responded. Um, and some of those people came out of Kids Club. So that's kind of some heavy stuff and kind of weighty um, when you think about it that, like, they were our people and we missed it and they're gone. And they were super in people too. Like they weren't just your flittery, I'm in college, I don't really care, I'm moving on, you know, sort of thing. Like very committed, hearty people um, that actually we found continued to tithe until they found a new church. So not only did they leave Kids Club um, or Crossroads, but they were so committed to the thing that we were doing that they still stuck with us until they found a new place to be. So that kind of sat with me in a weird, strange way, looking at like, how do I care for every single person on this team well? Um, that's a little bit about the attrition study. So we kind of have this like continuum in Kids Club, right? You're a volunteer and then you have a room leader. So volunteers kind of on deck to be a room leader. They're there, they're learning from you, they have leadership in place. And they could one day be a room leader who leads the volunteers on the team in that classroom here at Oakley. Um, some other sites do it a little bit differently, but because we have five services, this is the way we can manage our people. Um, and then underneath the, or above the room leaders, we have kind of the service leader who leads room leaders at their service hour. Um, and the service leader role is kind of changing a little bit. It used to be more of like a um, managing, opening up classrooms, kind of a frantic thing. And what it's kind of leaning into more is more of a past room role, making sure room leaders are taken care of spiritually, that they're getting the resources they need to connect with their volunteers, and um, just really care and love those people. Kristen, I got a quick question. Sure. Who would be a service leader? Um, you do not have one right now. It okay. used to be Meredith. She left for the oh, side. okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. So if you don't know that you have one, like, you don't have one. <laughs> um, let's see. John Wilson is the 1145 service leader for the entire hour. I'm working on getting him another person because that's six people that he leads. And I'd like a service leader to lead four to three people. That's more manageable for someone. A room leader leads, you know, I mean, you could have six, seven people on your team. But, I mean, are you really discipling them on a weekly basis? Probably not. You're more checking in with them, like we had mentioned before. Um, caring for them on a quarterly basis with like taking them out, that sort of thing. So um, different kind of level of discipling. That makes sense. Yeah, so sorry, Andy. That's you okay. don't have one yet. No, that's all right. I'm working on it, though. It's like maternity work plan goals. Um, and kind of going along the same continuum for presenter leaders, we have volunteers. And the people that are on this trajectory are leading connect time, they're actively leading small groups. They're not just hanging in the back. Like they're using their voice in some capacity in the room, which puts them on deck to present one day and lead a large group. Um, and that's going to become a little bit more um, easy for people to do coming into this new structure that we're going to be looking at in the next hour. So people will be able to come on deck a little bit quicker. Um, and then we have people that lead presenters by age group. Um, and they've just really been people who have helped coordinate presenter schedules really um, have done activities for them, group meetings, we've done things with kindergarten, it's been awesome. Um, and Victor is now like taking that to a new level and like meeting with people. So it, it's been really great. So they get loved too. So in John 21, one through 17, Jesus comes back and he's talking to Peter and he asked Peter how um, to feed his sheep and um, talks about feeding sheep Helping lambs. Yeah. It's good stuff. I can't remember it all off the top of my head. We'll just blame the baby. But we have three things. We have lambs in Kids Club. We have goats in Kids Club. And we have sheep in Kids Club. 
and how do you feed them? The lambs on our teams are observers. They're super fresh. They're coming in with brand new eyes. They are probably feeling extremely overwhelmed when they walk in the door. They have no idea what to expect. Um, they're looking for a leader. They're looking for guidance. Someone that comes up to them immediately like, hi, I'm Shanti. Welcome to first grade. Um, it might seem a little bit crazy right now. We're checking some kids in, but don't worry. I'm here to be your guide. And kind of going over what is the hour going to be about? Like, what are we going to do in here? Making them feel super, super welcomed and calm at the beginning is essential for a little lamb. They have no idea what's going on. Just like a little lamb in real life. They need to be guided. They need to be penned in. Don't give them a lot of responsibilities. Um, goats are our leaders in training. We call them goats because these are the people that start to see that things can be a little bit different. They want to go off the path a little bit or they're exploring new territory in your room. They're starting to lead connect time. They're um, interested in doing large group, but they're not quite sure. You want to make sure that you're right there alongside a goat, throwing stones at their feet, redirecting them up to the path of what you expect of them as a room leader um, and what you expect of them as a volunteer in your room so that you're training them up in the way that they should go. That's biblical too. <laughs> and they're sheep or teammates. They're the sweet people. They know what they're doing. They know their spot. They know their groove. They're going after it. Um, and we feed our sheep by having them be, feel celebrated and known. So we talked a little bit about the attrition study. People didn't feel known. Um, but we also want to celebrate our people too. So if you can continue to think about those two things when you're leading your people, they're going to, like, you're not going to miss it. Like, you're going to know who they are. You're going to know why they're not there on the weekend because they had knee surgery and they're back. So we're going to celebrate them. We're going to give them a card or a cake. Um, we're excited. We're going after the one on our teams too. For a while, when I um, first started on staff, I had a list of about 400 people that were on the roster for K to fifth. And after a couple of weeks, I started realizing there are not 400 people serving on the weekend in this group. Like if there were, we wouldn't have issues. So <laughs> I quickly discovered that there were a lot of people as I reached out to them that had left, had gone to another site, no one knew. Um, Left, left crossroads, gone to another site. Um, some people got ill and they just couldn't come around anymore. Uh, but no one told anybody about it. And other people um, that lost their jobs had to go on weekend work so they couldn't come around anymore. Um, yeah, so there's just a lot of like heaviness when I started reaching out to people and finding out why. And some of it was okay. Some of it was like, we moved on or we had a baby and it was okay. We, we did it for a season. And that's totally fine. Like people do things in seasons and we need to accept that as volunteers. Like you're not going to be around forever. Like things come in seasons, but um, let's make sure that when people do pass off, we, we celebrate them and thank them and move on. This is kind of just a chart that I thought was really helpful to kind of look at the continuum again of people, observers. <coughs> um, they want to be here. They want to learn. I mean, now you have to jump through a lot of hoops to be a volunteer in Kids Club. We have an application that's online, sort of, and paper, sort of. So they have to fill that out. They have to provide references and submit to a background check. And nothing can come back sketchy on any of those. Um, and sometimes it does, and we have fun conversations. Um, they have to go to KC 101, so that's a Sunday, 10.05, that they have to give up, or a Saturday. Excuse me. Um, they have to have a phone call interview with me, which can be super intimidating. Um, usually they're about 15 minutes, but I do ask them, like, personal questions, spiritual things, because you do need to be a follower of Jesus upstairs. So they are willing to share those stories with me, um, and they have to pick a team. So they need to observe. They need to fill out a green card. So there's a a high threshold to become a volunteer upstairs. And so when people onboard and then they offboard immediately, there's something going on there. Like they obviously were super excited to be here and something fell through when they became a team member. And sometimes it's like, shoot, my wife got pregnant and now we have no time. I'm so sorry. Okay. Other times it's like a uh, crisis happened. This happened in the fall. No one knew and they just kind of fell by the wayside. So that kind of sucks too. Uh, leader training, those are those on deck kind of people. We've talked about, we did it, um, the leader training in December about 
training up your people, walking them around the square. Even if you're not going to leave Kids Club anytime soon, it's still good to train up another volunteer that could do what you're doing because they might be needed at another hour. You could challenge them to go to another service hour that needs a volunteer leader who is left. Um, they could take your place when you're sick or out of town or on vacation. It's just nice to make sure that like you could get hit by a bus tomorrow and someone could take your job. Chris reminds me of that all the time. Like you could get hit by a bus and then who would do your role? I'm like, I don't know. I don't have anything written down. I started to, um, and I'm pretty sure you guys would figure it out. So it'd be fine. Anyway, not going to get hit by a bus. And then we have the leader. So some of the action steps that I wanted to give you guys, um, before we close out this first hour, know your team, make a list. Who are the people that are actually on your team? Do you know them by name? Are they a student? Are they um, just a regular volunteer? Are they someone that comes like once a month? Are they hitting the nail? Um, kindergarten through second grade, we're asking people to volunteer two times a month. It doesn't have to be every other week, two times a month. And maybe one month it's three times and one month it's once, but are they hitting that nail? Are you challenging them? Third to fifth grade, we're asking for three out of four weekends. Are you challenging your teammates? to be here? Do you know them? Do you know what's going on with them? Do you know where they live? Are you celebrating? Once a quarter, we'll give resources up to $15 per person. You can celebrate them. You can have something in your home. You can take people out. Um, you can just do like coffee here afterward, you know, get a little cake or something. Like, are you celebrating the people on your team for who they are? Um, encourage your team. After a rough hour, whew, let's go to Mad Tree. Like, we need that, you know, or everybody, that was really tough. And are you like commiserating? Are you encouraging them? Like, thank you so much for stepping up and leading Debbie. Like, I really appreciate that, you know, and then get to know your one up. If you're a room leader and there's a service leader above you, get to know them. They should be getting to know you if they exist. Um, they might not exist and that's okay. <laughs> and if it's not, it's probably me. So get to know them. They want to know you. They'll link to you. I also have cards up here. Once you've made the list of who's on your team, write them a note, encourage them, really simple. Um, please take some notes. And then once you wrote your little note to them, if you don't have their address, you can send them back to Kids Club on the weekend, bring them to me or someone on staff and we'll finish filling them out and mail them for you. And if you do know the air address and you don't wanna waste a stamp, I have plenty of stamps and resources. I will stamp them and mail them for you. Everyone should do this, and it's gonna be really exciting. I love getting mail, and I think it'd be really sweet. I know one teammate that was um, here on Sunday, he actually started taking the initiative of writing notes to observers, like thanking them for being there on the team, and like really has encouraged people to come back, and he's gotten some people out of that, so it was really sweet. Can we get addresses from you? Yes, you can get addresses from me, yes. If you don't have a roster of your teammates with, addresses I'm happy to give that to you mm -hmm. just send me a note because a brain these are some other resources I'm gonna leave these up during our five minute break so you can write them down or take a screenshot if you'd like and again I'll send out these slides so we'll take um, about a three five minute break and we'll be back to hear from Allison and Abby thanks guys can I pause this for five minutes <laughs> I'm going to do it. We'll see what happens. 